But with some historic sites, the researchers have a bit more of the original structure to work with, such as the monumental blue stones of Stonehenge in Wiltshire. However, in this case, the original acoustics haven't been destroyed by bombs. It's a much more subtle enemy, the nearby traffic of the A303, combined with the gradual decay of the site over thousands of years. We now enter the world of archaeoacoustics, which is basically sound archaeology, travelling back in time using sound and music as our time machine. Starting again with a basic recording in an anechoic chamber, this is how simple hand clapping would have sounded in the centre of Stonehenge 4,000 years ago. It illustrates the echoes and high frequencies that are present when particular sounds are introduced. At the University of Huddersfield, this was the starting point for the research of Dr Rupert Till into the archaeoacoustics of Stonehenge. Well, we started off using the same software that Damien had been using. He'd been using it to reconstruct Coventry Cathedral. I realised that we could do the same thing with Stonehenge, so that we could drop a model of Stonehenge into this software and out would come for the first time in 4,000 years, what it would have sounded like to be in Stonehenge back then. In addition to clapping, Rupert was able to use the computer modelling to play in the sounds of wind and thunder to see how the acoustic layout of Stonehenge would be affected. In this recording, as well as the echoes and reverberations caused by the simulated thunder and wind noise, you can also hear a distinctive underlying sound. Stonehenge is designed in a particular way and one of its key properties that affects its acoustics is the fact that it's circular. And because it's circular, like a bottle, it has a resonance and at a certain point it will start to ring. Now this ringing changes any sound that's inside it. Imagine being inside a bottle when someone's blowing over the top of it. So if it was a windy day at Stonehenge, the wind blowing across the top of the site could make it resonate as if it was a person blowing over the top of a bottle. Because the original site isn't complete, we thought, well, what would be ideal would be to build a full-size model of Stonehenge out of stone, but obviously that was impossible, it would be a huge job. But God bless the Americans, they, they'd done it already. And there is a concrete reconstruction of Stonehenge full-size in a place called Mary Hill. So we thought, great, we can go out there, we can use it as a model and do some testing. And it's made of concrete, which actually is pretty similar to stone in, in terms of its acoustic response. It was based on archaeological plans, not exactly accurate, but, but not bad. So we went over there to do a kind of full set of acoustic tests. And I believe you discovered that the acoustics of Stonehenge sometimes sounded like a very deep bass synthesizer sort of takes me back to my student days in the early 80s maybe Depeche Mode or someone like that it's quite hard to imagine really we put different frequencies different single kind of sine waves into the space until we found the ones that made the whole place come alive and when we swept a sine wave a frequency up from below what you can hear up to about 47 hertz which is an octave lower than a voice can sing it's like a very, very low bass sound, lower than a bass guitar. Suddenly the place came to life and made this deep kind of throbbing noise. And we realised this was the resonant frequency of the space. This was the note the bottle produced. Even Thomas Hardy back in Victorian days seemed to have been aware of it. Yes, I've actually got a description here from the end of Hardy's novel, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, where Tess has made her way to Stonehenge, along with her husband, Angel Clare, and Tess is just about to be arrested at the Stonehenge site for the murder of Alec D'Urberville. Uh, so here's the, the extract from the book. It says, What monstrous place is this? said Angel. It hums, said she. Hearken. He listened. The wind playing upon the edifice produced a booming tune, like the note of some gigantic one-stringed harp. Angel then goes on to describe the site as a very temple of the winds. And I've also got here a newspaper article. It's an interview with Thomas Hardy, published in the Daily Chronicle in 1899. Um, so he's asked about the notable qualities of Stonehenge. Um, 
which which was near to where he lived, and he stated that if a gale of wind is blowing, the strange musical hum emitted by Stonehenge can never be forgotten. Yeah, the Hardy Society were great. They helped us dig that old interview out. But I think it's amazing when he was asked, what's the most amazing thing about Stonehenge? And he was a big fan of Stonehenge. He lived nearby. But he said not that it looks magnificent or it's famous. He said the sound it makes was the most important thing to him. Do you have a good idea of what the full acoustic experience would have been like for someone during a ritual at Stonehenge, say, 4,000 years ago? The example we've got to play starts off with a kind of bass drum going bomb, 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 bomb. But as I walk through the space holding a microphone, if you move a metre to the side, because of the resonance, the sound changes dramatically. So it goes from bomb, bomb, bomb to wah, 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 to wah, 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 and changes completely as you walk through. I had a friend who's an archaeologist who makes clay drums that are based on prehistoric clay drums. So we tried using recordings of those as well, and we played a number of these handheld drum sounds into the space. And again, it created this huge bass note, this whoa, 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 bass sound appeared. So that kind of indicated that, yes, if you'd had people playing little handheld clay drums with a type that we know existed in prehistory, they could have made the place ring. Our calculations reckoned you might need 100 people. By ringing, I mean that Thomas Hardy booming note, the, the blowing over the top of the bottle sound, the wine glass ringing sound. That's the 47 hertz frequency. That is this booming tune. It's all 47 hertz. So we kind of went on from there to create reconstructions, musical reconstructions, to take sounds of drumming, the sounds of the wind blowing, of thunder, kind of create an experimental reconstruction of what it might have sounded like to be at a ritual at Stonehenge thousands of years ago. Whether they tried to build the acoustics intentionally or not, they built acoustics, they made acoustic effects, and they would have noticed those acoustic effects. Can you describe how studying the acoustics of somewhere like Stonehenge might help feed in to designing, say, a modern concert hall? Are there lessons that can be learnt? I was quite surprised, actually, the acoustics of Stonehenge match up to modern concert venues. Um, and we don't build concert venues with no roof on. So I've actually been working with some people who are interested in designing outdoor performance spaces, you know, for a warmer climate than Britain. And Stonehenge would be a very good one. If you wanted a design for an outdoor space, Stonehenge would be a pretty good way forward. So although we think we know a huge amount about acoustics nowadays, there are things to learn from the way they managed to design the space. Our audio journey now takes us from archaeoacoustics to sound artists Louise K. Wilson and David Chapman.